move over Hertz and budget, there's a new option for renting a car in Boston. Borrow your neighbors. At a price, of course. Greater Boston's Jacqueline Cashman explains how Relay Rides has created a peer-to-peer car-sharing marketplace. Michael Monroe lives in Somerville and sold his car two years ago because he didn't want the financial and logistical hassle of owning a vehicle in the city. So he rents one from time to time. And I feel much freer now, ironically, not owning a car because there are all these options now. Between the trains, my own two good legs, a bicycle and relay rides, I, I feel really covered. Monroe uses relay rides to help him find a car in his neighborhood that he can rent directly from the car owner. He rents cars by the hour and the cost of the gas is on the owner. There is a gas card that's, uh, that's part of this whole thing. So the rule is if it's a quarter tank low, um, you just fill it up. One big component of this service is trust because in this case, the owner has to give the renter access to the garage with other personal belongings inside. You know, it really is an exercise in community and trust. And I think part of what's self-selecting about something like Relay Rides is that you know, people who are joining up you know, aren't uh, scheming for the heist of the century. Relay Rides started last year and is currently only in Boston and San Francisco. It allows owners to rent out their idle vehicles with the owner controlling the rates and the availability of the car. Relay Rides provides an online marketplace and a $1 million insurance policy to make the transaction safe and convenient. Car sharing in the United States has grown substantially. In 2009, there were 400,000 users. Today, 600,000 users. Studies predict that by 2016, 4.4 million drivers will be in this marketplace. That has Kevin Patton-Hawk seeing green. It's a kind of a neat neighborhoody thing. It's very fun to bump into someone who's renting the car. He rents out his vehicle to strangers for $7 an hour, and in return, he gets some spare cash. I don't count on the money, you know, but we use the money. Patton Hawk says Relay Rides makes him take better care of his car and also often uses the money for car repairs and maintenance. He gets about $150 to $300 a month without any heavy lifting. With me now are Relay Rides founder Shelby Clark, along with Richard Mulligan from Mint Cars, another car sharing service, and technology analyst Sarah Sklarzik. Welcome to all of you. So, Shelby, I know that you're using this right now. You live in San Francisco, but right. obviously here in Boston talking to <laughs> us. So, you're using one of the relay cars. That's right. And how much are you paying for that? Um, so, right now, uh, I'm driving uh, Baruch's 2009 uh, BMW Coupe. It's six bucks an hour. So, just a couple blocks from the office, pretty good deal. And you go on. How does it work? So, you go online and you find the the closest car to you. Yep, you put in um, you know, your search criteria, so the time, the location, and the type of car. So you might be looking for something fun or maybe an SUV or a convertible. Um, you find out what's, uh, what's located uh, close to you. Um, you. You reserve the car, and then uh, whenever you have the car reserved, you just walk up to the car. You hold the membership card over a sensor in the windshield. The car unlocks, and uh, you drive off. And all you're paying is $6 an hour? 6 bucks an hour. So how is Baruch that making any money? Because that doesn't sound like a lot, <laughs> especially if you're doing nothing but driving around. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I think uh, an hour, if you, um, if you add it up, uh, people make a lot of money. So, you know, my cars in the, in the marketplace, I made about $400 last month. So uh, I got a free car. You know, I made my payment, made my insurance, and, um, you know, and I have a, a great car to drive around whenever I do need one. Richard, is this a model, yours is a little different. Yours is a little more akin to, to Zipcar in that you have a fleet of cars. Correct. They're at certain locations around the city. Correct. Is this a model that can only be done in urban areas, or, or can you do it in less populated places? I think if there is a, uh, essentially enough demand for anything, you can do it either place. Um, where there is a fleet involved such as ours, I think it's more um, better housed in an urban area, whereas Relay Reds, I think, can go suburban or in the inner city. The advantage to being in the inner city for us is that for every uh, car sharing car that's put on the road, it has the potential to take anywhere from 6 to 18 cars privately owned off of the road. So it, it eases congestion and actually contributes to the neighborhood as opposed to putting all these extra cars in there. And so what did you recognize in the marketplace that, that you decided that you would open up a, a business to go up against Zipcar, which, which had already had for about 10 years a major presence? I mean, well, they've done an outstanding job in uh, basically taking sort of a niche industry and making it more mainstream. Boston is one of the only uh, major cities in uh, not only North America but across the world that doesn't have more than one player. So there's always room for 
uh, additional players as the industry grows. Sarah, you're the analyst here. In, in looking at what's happening around the country in, in spots like Boston and San Francisco, do you think that we really are moving toward this situation where we could be a, a carless society? Absolutely. Um, so companies like eBay have gotten people very comfortable with the idea of sharing or selling something online that they don't need or they don't use very often. Uh, people are already doing that with their houses. So Airbnb is a company that's only a few years old. Uh, it already has reached a valuation of a billion dollars. That's billion with a B. <laughs> And that allows people to rent out their houses when they're not using their houses. And so overall what you have are, um, is, a, is a society where people are becoming more comfortable sharing or selling things that they don't need or they don't use. Well, I mean, certainly for a lot of people, the, the reason you have a car is for convenience because it's always at your disposal. So uh, how are people, any of you can answer this, but how are people making it work when there, there, all be, there will be moments where your car isn't available anymore? Well, um, the reality is that the average car is driven uh, less than an hour a day. So 95% of the time, it's sitting on the side of the road. That's not true. That can't possibly be true. Uh, I drive well, I, my car way more than an hour well, I guess I guess if, if you uh, take into account uh, the number of minutes it's actually driving. So a lot of times, it's just sitting around. And uh, particularly if you're living in, in a city, um, public transit's great. And so uh, many people just use their car a couple times a week. Um, and so uh, if you can make it safe and convenient for people to be able to broadcast the availability of their car, they can still use it however, however they need. And then whenever they're not using it, um, they can lend a hand to their neighbor. So the car owner makes money. Um, the borrower uh, gets a way to get around and makes it easier to live without a car. And you know, they love that their dollars are going right back into the local economy as opposed to being sent all the way across the country to a big corporation. But this has got to be a certain individual, too, you know, somebody who lives in the city, somebody who may be able to walk in their neighborhood uh, to, to get their groceries or whatever. This isn't going to work for a family, necessarily, is it? I mean, I think it makes people uh, think about their schedule instead of just, uh, just second nature jumping into the car to do one errand. They now do two, three, four errands through the, the Home Depot trip or the, the Ikea trip and make it strategic as opposed to just knee-jerk to get in the car and go somewhere. And I think that's where all of the uh, companies that are involved really make you rethink and sort of plan ahead instead of just second nature to jump in the car. Um, another group that, of families that we think could make um, great matches with car sharing are what we call one and a half or two and a half car families. So this is a, car, a family that always needs one car and sometimes needs a second. Um, and typically they round up, they'll, they'll buy that second car. Um, and frequently they'll buy a car that meets all their needs. Or, so, you know, only once a month they need you know, a big SUV to carry on six kids and a dog, but they have that SUV all the time. And so what we're hoping is that they can round down and they can actually buy uh, you know, a fuel-efficient car that makes sense for their family. And whenever they do need the bigger car, the extra space, uh, they, can, they can get one for their neighbor. All right, I'm going to be honest here and say I don't think that I want anybody else in my car. <laughs> I mean, admittedly, I'm sort of a neat freak, but I don't want a smoker in my car. I don't want somebody leaving their McDonald's bag and all the salt and fries all over my car. How do you guard against that? Well, not to mention the regular wear and tear. I mean, that guy had a very unfortunate choice of words in the piece when he talked about. I don't. It's nice to bump into people, but it made me think. Yeah, you, you're going to be checking your car every single time for scratches and bumper problems and everything. Well, I mean, there's. I think there's uh, two aspects to that. So the the first one is that borrowers treat the cars incredibly well. Um, you know, we really emphasize the the neighbor to neighbor connection that because they're neighbors. Because I don't think that's really true. Most people, anything that's not theirs, they're less concerned with it. Well, Especially but, when it comes to rental cars. Mm -hmm. Well, right. Yeah, there's the it's a rental mentality. Um, but, you know, just it, throughout the process, you can't help but know that this car belongs to a person. We highlight it on the car's profile. We have a letter from the car owner in the car. Just at every touch point, we really emphasize the fact the car belongs to a person. And, uh, and people like that. Um, and they really end up respecting the cars. And then in, in terms of, you know, um, uh, you saying that you wouldn't want somebody driving your car, uh, we're not for everybody. Um, but if you think about uh, the number of cars on the road, uh, there are 260 million cars in the United States alone. Uh, that's 1.2 cars for every licensed driver. Um, Zipcar, you know, uh, a billion-dollar company, has less than 10,000 cars. So, um, you know, even if we're only for a very, very small portion of the population, we can still have a really meaningful uh, marketplace Sarah, speaking of cars that are out on the road, you brought something to our attention today, which I wasn't even familiar with, which sounds pretty cool. In the video I saw, it was pretty cool, but this is Google's driverless cars. Yes. So Google has um, backed the development of self-driving cars. Actually, the cars were developed uh, through a DARPA-sponsored project. Uh, DARPA is, is the government agency that also sponsored the creation of the Internet. Uh, so these cars have done fantastically well, so well that DARPA has actually stopped funding it because uh, they realize it's ready for commercialization, and Google has jumped on board uh, and has backed the further development of these cars. So they've been driving on the public roads in California for a couple of years now. 
and Google just revealed that to the public. And so it's not completely driverless because the driver is in the driver's seat and, and from what I was reading it has all of these cameras and sensors but the driver is still there to take over should something... So it's better than driverless because the car can see in 360 degrees, the car can see at night, obviously a human driver can't do that. Um, the reason that there's a human driver in the cars now is mostly for insurance reasons. Now, speaking of insurance, how, how does that work you know, with all of you, especially with you? I mean, is it, how do you make sure that it's not cost prohibitive to have to insure your entire fleet of cars? Well, we do a fleet rate, and, and in each of the states that we operate in, there is state minimum coverage. So gas, insurance, and, um, and 180 miles are included in every, every reservation as a member. So what are you looking at in terms of how you'll advance your company in terms of what you offer and the benefits and how you make it distinct when you have programs like this, which are now in neighborhoods, you don't have to go to specific locations, right. you're hearing that driverless cars are about to come out on the road? Right. Well, I think our niche is uh, our price point. We have no annual fee. Our hourly rates are always at least 25% less expensive than some of the bigger uh, fleet-based uh, car sharing companies. And also to, uh, to have another player in the market. To, uh, people like to have choices. Every neighborhood has a Starbucks, every neighborhood has their mom and pop store, and we like to be the mom and pop store where people do have another alternative. How is your growth so far? Because you, you really need to make sure that you have well-populated areas. I mean, it doesn't really work to have one person here, one person in, <clears throat> you know, four streets over. Sure. Um, so right now we have um, a really healthy marketplace of about 200 cars and 4,000 borrowers. Uh, we just inked a deal with GM about uh, uh, two weeks ago where um, we did technology integration with OnStar. So any GM car owner um, who rents their car through Relay Rides, uh, a borrower can, can come up and actually unlock the car through their mobile phone with no technology, um, additional technology needed. So there's 15 million cars on the road that already have this technology in there. And, so, uh, and GM actually also just uh, uh, invested $3 million in the company, which we announced yesterday. So with the, the technology integration and the extra funding, um, you know, we're really looking to uh, expand aggressively. All right. Well, this is fascinating. I don't know. Maybe I'll think about it. $400, that's not so bad. Not too bad. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And in a moment, you better sit down, Tales from My Parents' Divorce. It's a new show at Arts Emerson.